Hi, I'm Dr. Boyce Watkins from Your Black World, and uh, the reason I'm dressed like this is because I just got back from the gym. I have been um, on a quest to try to get myself back into good physical shape, and there's a gym right around the corner from my house, so I try to walk over there and work out a little bit. And, uh, you know, when I do that, I, I love it because uh, the oxygen that flows to my brain kind of stimulates my thinking, and uh, I love to think. I think all the time. That's all I do this um, it's, a, it's an obsession for me. And, um, uh, you know, when I was on my way there, I was having conversations with people about some of, uh, some of, uh, some of the interesting uh, remarks and feedback that I've received on uh, an article that I wrote on a website called brothersonsports.com. And that's, uh, it, the nickname is Ball Sports. Uh, Ball stands for Brothers on Sports and Society. And the platform was created by myself and other brothers who wanted to have a place where black men could kick it. Uh, where black men could uh, express themselves in their pain and their experience and uplift each other without the scrutiny that comes from the rest of the world, that comes from uh, the liberals, that comes from the feminists, that comes from white folks. We just aren't trying to uh, have all that, you know. So, so this was our space, you know. In fact, we thought about making it a membership only or a password only kind of platform, but we decided against that because we want other people who want to understand the black male experience without judging to come in and and be a part of the family as well uh, because we, the goal at the end of the day is we have to build the black family and you know we don't build the black family by destroying and bashing black women that's why I went head to head with Lil Wayne last year and take complete pride in the fact that I was one of the people that helped, that helped destroy his deal with Mountain Dew because he had a lyric in his song talking about how he was going to rape and murder your girlfriend and send her dead body back to you. I found that to be unacceptable. Um, you know, I think that uh, in order to build a black family, not only must we work with black women as, as the queens that they either are or can be, uh, we must also demand that we be treated as the kings that we are. Um, you know, one of the things that concerns me is sometimes when I see a hardcore feminist uh, coming through who want to seem like they want to just um, emasculate and castrate black men at every chance they get um, that's not productive that's that's going that might lead you to be the victor but uh, if you come into every situation prepared for war then you will never have a chance to find true love so uh, and and what's interesting is that you see people go into their relationships like that they go into their relationships not seeking to come together not seeking to build not seeking to grow they're coming in seeking to dominate and to avoid being victimized and I understand that you know because I think that for many women unfortunately in America they were victimized by the first man they ever trusted their father uh, either victimized with the father not being around for whatever reason or their father doing something that um, led them to not trust him or maybe their parents were divorced or, or didn't get married or whatever um, I think that in the, even those situations, I think that we see them too, as too cut and dry. I think that the conclusion has been that black men are deadbeats and they abandon their kids. But I hear from a lot of brothers, um, enough brothers that remind me that that's not the case. Uh, not every black man who doesn't live with his child is not there because he just hates the kid and doesn't give a damn about them. And remember, it's easy to believe black men don't care about their children because the society thinks that we're animals. Um, think about the way you look at a, uh, the way some people look at maybe a dog. White, you know, white folks love dogs. They kind of see them as sort of like human. But black people, you know, we have a different kind of view, right? So, uh, if somebody talks about someone torturing a dog or abandoning a dog, or, or let's say it's not even a dog, let's say it's a pig or a chicken, most people aren't going to have much sympathy for the conditions of of th that a chicken lives in in KFC, or you know, the fact that a chicken was tortured or had his neck wrung, or a Thanksgiving turkey was uh, was beat to death before they cooked him and <laughs> you had dinner. Um, I think black men are kind of seen the same way. In fact, we're, we're probably seen as something even worse than, than farm animals. We're seen really like roaches. You know, nobody feels sorry for a roach, the pain of a roach when you step on it. And if, you, if you're looking for the evidence, look throughout our society. Look at how much atrocity is occurring amongst the black male community that is, um, that is not being uh, dealt with, that no one's really talking about. Even black men, I think, uh, so many are disillusioned and feel so powerless that even they don't speak up on their plate. Uh, many of the prominent black men, the entertainers and athletes and scholars and public figures on television who are making the money, who have the power, uh, they've realized that speaking up for other black men is really a lost cause. You know, they'll speak up for other prominent black men, 
you know, you'll see Kobe kicking it with, you know, with LeBron or and, and, and Jay-Z and all that, and they'll kind of back each other up. But when it comes to kind of looking out for the rank and file brothers, like the millions of brothers who are suffering prison torture and prison rape, uh, the brothers out here who are being shot in the street, the brothers out here who can't get a job, who are depressed and devastated, uh, who, who can't be heads of households because they've been so emasculated, uh, who are suffering from mental illness and disease and all these other things, uh, you don't hear people talk about that in mainstream media. And what's really unfortunate is that you don't even hear black people talking about that. And so, you know, ball sports is kind of built to kind of deal with that um, because we don't just talk about sports. We go outside the lines, kind of like ESPN's approach, right? Um, and uh, I'm very happy to be to join the brothers that, that are running this platform because I'm so proud of it. It makes me very happy. Um, you know, and uh, today I, I, I just share a couple of reflections that I had. Um, about what happened, you know, I talked to some people today who called me up on the phone. I talked to one of my really good friends, who's a who's a who's a very very uh, heavy duty feminist. I mean, she don't really play. Um, and I wanted her opinion, and I asked her. I said, I said it's so interesting. I said this article. I said uh, a lot of people have an issue with it. Why don't you read it and tell me what you think? And uh, she hasn't got back to me on it yet. But she, what she did see, she said she really couldn't understand, at least based on the way I explained what I was trying to say, she didn't see an issue. But, you know, I'll let you know what she says when, when she tells me. But uh, also I had I did have some people who said, you know, that they that people emailed them and said, oh, my God, did you see this article written by Boyce Watkins? And, and they read it and they were like, what's the issue? What's the problem? I don't see it. Um, and so... Uh, and the other thing that's interesting to me, too, is that most of the people who have been most critical um, are people who um, didn't read the article, number one, they just read the title. And that's a real problem when you have actual scholars who will evaluate um, an article based on the title. I mean, that's kind of crazy. Um, but, you know, to be truthful, I've made that mistake before, especially when I was younger, you know, because you get gung-ho, you get caught up on the political wave and you want to follow the, the trend and and, uh, and, and and you're trying to get to the top, you know, you're ambitious and maybe you just see an opportunity to shoot at somebody that you've never liked, and you know, from the jump. I know there are a lot of people out here who don't like me. I try to be a good person, but let's just, I'll just tell you the truth for anybody out here who's trying to do something. Uh, no matter what you do, you could be Mother Teresa. Somebody's always going to hate your guts. They're going to hate your ass just because you woke up in the morning and ate scrambled eggs. They, you know, so... The fact of the matter is that uh, there are some people who just are looking for any opportunity to jump on any bandwagon that will take you down, whether it's legitimate or not. That's the dirty game of politics. And so, um, but, you know, it's okay with me because, uh, number one, my ego is not really involved in this. You know, I, can, I don't care about being wrong. I don't even care about being powerful. I don't care about having fans. I don't look for fans. I mean, when people tell me I'm a big fan of your work and I love everything you do, you know, I kind of tell them, well, I appreciate that support. But ultimately, I, I want to know what you think. You need to form your own opinion. Don't don't let me tell you what to think. You know, that's a dangerous place to be. That's what Hitler did. That's how Hitler got people to kill the Jews, is he told them what to think, and they all bought into it without making their own decision. And so when I see this political football being tossed back and forth with the liberals and the conservatives and all that, you know, it kind of I kind of am reminded of that. Because if you, if you listen to a lot of the, you know, the dialogue, uh, that comes from people, and I'll just use my article as an example, um, you'll hear a lot of terminology that is very mainstream sort of pattern speech that you'll hear like in the feminist movement. Like for example, the term rape culture. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't remember hearing the term rape culture uh, before maybe 2010, maybe 2009. Um, again, I, I could be wrong, but it seemed that when Obama was elected, suddenly the term rape culture became a popular term for people to use. So I started seeing people using it all over the place. And I'm like, this is interesting, you know, that everybody's kind of saying the same thing. And 90% of those people, it didn't even read the article. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I just think that, you know, I mean, that's bullshit. I mean, you know, we, we got to seek the truth. And also the other issue, the other interesting thing that I, I've observed is that, um, you know, sometimes, and I, and I can't even pretend like I haven't done this myself. I mean, I, I probably, I'll probably do it in the future if I'm, when I'm not thinking, but, um, you know, it's so, when I see, uh, young scholars, you know, gunning at me, you know, I saw these young brothers who wrote this letter and I thought, this is so interesting. This is so animal kingdom. You know, they're seeing me, maybe they see me perched up on something and natural male competition, you know, that competition to be the quote unquote alpha male, whatever it is you believe you are. Not that I think I'm the alpha, but maybe some people see, see me in that light. You know, um, they, they compete, they, they, they shoot at the person they think is the king of the hill 
because it's going to get them up there. Like Kind of like how uh, 50 Cent dissed Jay-Z in order to get Jay-Z's attention, which elevated 50 Cent because Jay-Z responded. And, you know, my reaction is like, I'm not trying to be Jay-Z, man. Like, if you really want me to, like, work with you or support you or, or support your ideas, even if I disagree, just email me. Just ask me. You know, I, I don't have a horse in the game, man. I want to see black men speaking up. I want to, I just want to see you speaking the truth. I want to see you backing up your, your whatever the truth means to you. I want to see you backing up your points with valid arguments, um, you know, valid evidence. Um, the easiest way to dismantle most of the criticism that I've seen, uh, and, and, and I have a lot of energy. I mean, I can, I can fire off a thousand word article in about 20 minutes. So, you know, don't fuck with me on that. I, I will, <laughs> I will respond to you 90% of the time. Um, you know, but most of the criticism I've seen has been easy to dismantle because all I would just say is, um, okay, you say that I'm saying this and saying that and doing this and doing that. Can you provide a quote to make your point? You know, give me an excerpt. Show me something in my article that proves that I'm doing what you're saying. Um, and I'd say 95% of the time, people can't respond to that. Most of the people, uh, most of the critics have not been able to do that, which right there tells me, okay, you've got some preconceived agenda. You, you're bringing some preconceived issue that you have, maybe with men, maybe with, with legitimate rape cases, which I think we should certainly prosecute. I got daughters. Of course, I don't want men out here just raping women for no reason. Um, you, you know, you see, you've seen things I've written about R. Kelly. I can't stand R. Kelly because I live in Chicago with, with R. Kelly. And I can't stand this dude because I don't like the fact that, it, that there's a lot of evidence that you know he did some things he shouldn't have done um but at the same time it's like you know i mean am i am, am i really the target that you're aiming for or are you aiming for something else you know um a woman that i really respect uh who ran um essence magazine for a lot of years uh oh lord what's her name uh susan taylor uh, I saw Susan Taylor on a cruise, and I, I love Susan Taylor. Um, I really do. I mean, I, she's such a pleasant human being. And I remember Susan once said something that really got my attention. Um, and uh, you know what? Scratch that. I got it wrong. It wasn't Susan who said this. It was actually um, uh, the woman who wrote Black Pain, Terry Williams. Terry Williams said, hurt people hurt people. And I think in our community, that's what I see. I see a lot of pain. Um, I see a lot of black folks who have endured, you know, um, unthinkable trauma. I'm one of them, you know. Um, I have seen my best friend get killed, saw my older brother die. I've seen too many men in my family go to prison. I've been treated, you know, I've gone through the, 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 the pain of being treated as a second-class citizen. I've been abused as a child. My father wasn't there. My stepfather stepped in, but my real dad was not there. Um, and, uh, you know, and the list goes on and on. And, you know, sometimes when you go through that kind of pain, you lash out, you fight, you attack anybody, you know, you look at any other animal, look at an abused puppy, you know, that abused puppy, if you go up and you try to pet him or feed him, he, what's he going to do? He's going to bite your hand off. And, you know, and I think that's kind of what we have sometimes where I'll see people just coming at a situation with so much raw emotion, like, oh, F you, you, blah, 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 you know, and, um, you know, I guess it is what it is. I don't think, I don't know how we can change that right away, but I do think that, you know, if we're trying to really build our community, I think that if you you start with scholars, I think black scholars need to work together. We need to communicate with each other. Uh, We need to learn to learn how to disagree without, you know, and a brother uh, that I spoke with today actually brought that point up and I agree with him hundred percent. We have to learn how to disagree without trying to dismantle each other. You know, when I read a letter, it was like, your arguments were thoughtless and callous and, and I had people questioning the validity of my credentials and 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 I mean that was a little hurtful because I was like man like I went to school I graduated from college uh, at the age of 22 I had a 3.9 grade point average I got a triple major um, in finance economics and business management I got two bachelor's degrees when I graduated not one and I did it all in four years while I worked uh, a full-time job two full actually two big part-time jobs so I was working like 60 hours a week and then from the age of 22 to 31 um, I was in school uh, I got several ma- I, I completed the credentials for several master's degrees um, got a PhD I was admitted to the PhD program at Columbia University which admits almost nobody um, out of hundreds of applicants they might admit eight people um, you know I studied 10 hours a day seven days a week I literally catered my whole life around trying to be the best scholar I could be and so 
when, you know, obviously, you know, when I hear the criticism, like, oh, you're stupid, and you're not a legitimate scholar, who gave you a PhD, you know, of course, I, it doesn't bother me that much, you know, it's like, okay, you know, it's like, um, I don't know, it's like telling Shaquille O'Neal that he's short, you know, like, he's, he's gonna laugh it off, but at the same time, it's kind of like, you know, from other black male scholars, I'm not particularly, um, I don't think it's always so productive for them to sort of bat, go for my head when they're trying to get me to see their point of view um a you can call me on the phone b you could write your own opinion send it to me i'll publish it i don't mind people i don't try to restrict information from black people i want them to see all the information uh c you can tell me you know boys uh you know i i love you to death you you're grace you know i think your work is extraordinary i love it whatever it is you want to say whatever little flatteries you want to throw in there and then Go into your piece. Say, I can't stand what you just said. What you said was totally fucked up. Okay, fine. I accept that. Um, let's debate. Let's fight it out. Let's get on Skype. Let's 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 have a let's have let's have a, let's have it out so that we can find the truth, right? So that we're not sitting here sort of being puppetized by these other people out here, these other folks who don't give a damn about you or me, who want to see a bunch of Negroes killing each other off, and let's get rid of them and let's just talk like men or men and women, or as a family, so we can find a resolution, so we can create light that doesn't generate fire, or fire and smoke, but, but light that actually, heat that actually generates light, so that we can actually see our way to the truth, and you get what I'm saying, I'm screwed that up, but you get the point, um, so, you know, I'll just say this, um, you know, I learned a whole lot about dealing with uh, this kind of criticism. Uh, three examples that came to mind when I was walking back from the gym. One was uh, a guy I mention all the time because I just love him so much is uh, Louis Farrakhan, who actually told me um, that you learn a lot from your critics. Uh, he told me a story personally about Julianne Malvo and how she was very critical of him, really went for the jugular, really went hard at him. And he had to take the time to listen to uh, what Julianne was saying so he could at least understand where she was coming from and it made him a better man and uh, and it made me really rethink how I deal with my critics, critics because sometimes again when, when they say hurt people hurt people sometimes when you're hurt you're like man oh screw you and you go you want to fight and all that and now you know when I'm in my right mind I calm down and I say okay boys listen to what this person's saying try to at least get in their shoes even if you never agree because sometimes you're going to fight forever because there really is no one solution there is no one truth um, and that's something I think that we have to accept. Um, uh, so that's that's one person who taught me a lot about dealing with criticism. Um, another person, and actually there was uh, another great example that Cornell West shared about he and Farrakhan, where Cornell had criticized Farrakhan for his uh, w his words uh, about Jewish people, and he he referred he said he was anti being anti-Semitic, and they sat it down and they talked it out and they pulled out the Bible, they talked until 6 the next morning. I think they got there at 5 p.m. and talked till 6 a.m. And when they got done, they emerged as friends. Farrakhan evolved. Cornell West evolved. And they stayed together as a family. Um, I learned a lot from that conversation that Cornell West told me about that. I hope he doesn't mind me telling that story. Um, there's another person, um, and I don't know what people think about it one way or the other, but uh, when I worked last year on a mass incarceration campaign with Russell Simmons, uh, Russell actually taught me a lot about the power of forgiveness now mind you we know the, the, you know some of the challenges russell has had i mean that harriet tubman video i was like brother i don't you know i mean when we talked and i wrote my article about it i was like man i don't know what i can really say about that man because that's kind of you know you need, i think you need to apologize which which he did immediately but even with an apology it was it still stung um but here's the thing that uh i learned about russell you know um the way Russell and I came to know each other was I was a critic, you know. I talked about the Rush card pretty pretty harshly. I still don't, I still wouldn't, I still don't know if I'd buy a Rush card. I'll, I'll say that. Um, I don't agree with everything Russell does or how he does it. But I accept the fact that sometimes people do things differently. And I can say that I was absolutely stunned by how respectful he was toward me. Um, even though I was like, man, I'm, I'm a critic of his. But yet he has been uh he has responded to my hate with love and and i said this is this is so powerful right now because you know it's that's the thing like you know when you see fire and you see someone throwing fire at you sometimes you just want to throw more grease on the fire you make you want to make a bigger fire to, to get their fire going and all and then at the end of the day all that happens is the forest burns down 
but when you when you follow up hate with love with extreme love with with unconditional um fearless love and compassion uh you you tend to disarm even the most um uh, even the nastiest uh, of your critics you know and so so in my mind you know it kind of um helped me evolve you know as a man you know just kind of seeing how russell dealt with me um uh, the third person i learned from is a, a guy that i consider to be a mentor uh he's the reason i'm a i'm a public scholar today and that's michael eric dyson um i have been very frustrated with uh with some of the things dyson has said in the last few years um since obama got elected um you know but you know, and, and then I've been, I've told the truth, you know, when I was a kid, my mother used to say, boy, your mouth will either make you great or get you killed. I'm curious to see which one. And, you know, Dyson, every time I, I've critiqued him, I always start off by telling the truth that, you know, if I had never heard of him, I, I wouldn't be who I am today. I wouldn't be doing what I do today. I'll say that um, my three, the three first three black public intellectuals I ever saw were Michael Eric Dyson, Julianne Malvo and Cornell West. Um, and uh, I saw Dyson on BET just firing off 100 miles an hour, you know, with this smooth vernacular. I, I can't, I can't, I can't do what that dude does. He, he's, he's a beast. Um, but I was like, wow, this is pretty neat. You know, this guy is isn't intelligent, and he's, he's advocating for black people, and he's getting his respect, and he's, he's a new kind of scholar. You know, he's not some nerd sitting in an office writing research papers that nobody's ever going to read. Maybe I can do that. And then I remember Julianne Malvo. I remember the first time somebody said, have you ever heard of Dr. Julianne Malvo? And they sent me a copy of her book, Sex, Lies, and Stereotypes. And I read that book from cover to cover, and I loved that book. And then Cornell West, I remember reading his book, Race Matters, in, in the 90s. And I remember meeting Cornell for the first time at University of Chicago uh, in 1998-ish, I think. And uh, he, he shook my hand. I tried to ask him a question, but he blew me off. He, he don't remember that. I ain't brought it up to him. But, uh, but you know, he, he had to blow me off because there was like 100 people in line behind me. Now I understand. I mean, when you got 50 people trying to talk to you, it's hard to sit and talk 10 minutes with one person. Um, uh, and, and that's, you know, I go through that frustration a lot because you have to be rude to people. And I don't like to be rude. Um, but anyway, long story short, um, you know, with Dyson, you know, I've always tried to begin any critique of him by reminding him of the fact that I just have so much respect for him and so much appreciation uh, for him giving birth to me as a scholar to, to some extent. Um, and, and then I, I might go hard. I'm going to tell the truth. But then every time he responds to me, even when he's mad, even when he is livid, I'm talking about I'm talking about text messages that could that would be a 10 page book. You know, it's like at the end of the day, we know it's a sport. It's like uh, to to some extent, and it's all love. It's like basketball. Like when I get you on the court, I'm gonna try to dunk on you. I'm a, I'm a, I'm not gonna give you an inch. I'm not gonna let you have a point. I'm gonna hurt your feelings. But after we're done, we're gonna go and get a you know get a drink and chill out, and we will be friends again. And I think that that's really what we need to have as scholars. We need to learn how to disagree without trying to kill each other because we don't need black on black crime amongst black scholars. Um, you know, so uh, that's that's the only thought that I had today or a set of thoughts. Um, you know, I hope I didn't ramble too much and I hope that I was honest in terms of what I think. What you see is what you get. I'm not trying to put on airs or, or maintain some sort of some sort of image. You know, this, this I'm not you know, I'm not trying to be a, a corporate Negro. Now, I do have a business. You got to have a business. I got to feed my kids and feed myself, feed my family because I ain't trying to go beg white folks for money. That's for damn sure. Um, but, you know, at the same time, you know, my goal is not to be the corporate Negro. So uh, uh, I hope that what I'm saying is received in the appropriate way. If people disagree, please leave comments. Uh, please tell me what you think. Your opinion is respected. In fact, if you have things that you'd like to write and submit, um, I don't control the editorial process entirely with your black world. I deliberately democratize that so the editors all have equal say in what goes up, what goes down. But if you write something and it's, you know, there it doesn't have any typos in it, you know, and the grammar is like halfway decent, you'd be amazed how many, uh, unfortunately, how many of us black folks uh, did not receive proper grammatical training in school, um, myself included. Um, but, you know, uh, but if, if, it, if it makes sense, and you have an opposing viewpoint, if, and even if the viewpoint is, Boyce Watkins sucks, and here's why, 
please send it to us. We will publish it. We will share it. Um, we want people to have all the information so they can make their own opinion. And I think that's what any good scholar should want for his or her people. And I encourage other people to adopt that, uh, a similar philosophy or at least consider it. Well, I'm Dr. Boyce Watkins from Your Black World. Take care. God bless and have a wonderful day. I am gone. Peace.